Hi, welcome to the 13th Floor. I'm Marty Duda. Today we have film director Will Watson, who is about to premiere his new documentary called Soldiers Without Guns. Uh, welcome, Will. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me along. Nice to be up here on the top of Simon Street. Beautiful place here. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, for folks who won't be familiar with the film, since it hasn't been shown anywhere yet, mm -hmm. give us a brief synopsis of what the documentary is all about. The documentary is about ending a 10-year civil war in a completely different way. Right. So the civil war um, went for 10 years. There have been 14 failed peace agreements. New Zealand says we're going to jump in and try and end it. And we're going to take guitars and women and um, culture to end a war. And everyone, including myself, who happened to be a journalist at the time, thought that this was not only revolutionary, but also insane. Right. And why would we want to get involved in anyone else's war and don't do it? It was right. certainly from the Wellington, that was the chorus that was being sung by all the journalists, uh, how wrong we were. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Civil War was happening where? Uh, the Civil War was in Bougainville. So Bougainville was actually, it's interesting because Bougainville is part of Papua New Guinea, but geographically, if you look at it, they are part of the Solomon Island chain and they look like Solomon Islanders, they talk like Solomon Islanders because they are Solomon Islanders. Yeah. And for some, well, not for some reason, but they got split away because when Papua New Guinea was um, formed in the 1970s, it was decided that the copper that was coming out of Bougainville Island would be good to set up the little fledgling country of Papua New Guinea. So right. half the wealth of an entire nation was coming from one copper mine. Yeah. Right. It was a huge, it was like the biggest copper mine on the planet, it, it wasn't it? It was the biggest copper mine on the planet. I've been there. It's two miles wide, half a K deep. It's the biggest man-made hole on the planet. Yep. Uh, it rose the Java River, the main river there, 300 feet, almost all the way to the sea. Right. Um, I've never seen, you know, runoff or anything like that. It's just a, and it's apocalyptic now. I mean, I hate using the word apocalyptic, but <laughs> you go there and it's just, Build, you know, rusty old buildings and huge, huge um, trucks that are like 30 feet high, just rusting and right. burnt out tires. And it's just like another world, you know. Crazy. Uh, so how did you get involved in the idea of m making, because you've been working on this film for years. Yeah, 13 years. So 13 years, why yeah. the obsession and why why is it finally here now? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the word obsession is a good, that's probably the best description of it. Um, the... Um, I had followed the story as a journalist, young journalist in Wellington, I was, I was studying journalism and I followed that story and I was amazed, one, that they'd pulled it off and two, I'd, I was in Auckland at the time and I had a child, a little baby daughter and while I was, you know, hanging with her on the weekend, I was reading the, the, the weekend paper and there was a child's hand reaching out of the rubble of a blown up building in the Middle East. And I'd, I'd traveled a lot of the Middle East and that's a, that's a child, a sweet innocent child's life just vanished mm -hmm. through a, a bombing. And I really felt that it was time for me to actually say, look, there's other ways of ending war. Um, you know, let's let's look at them. Let's let's take New Zealand's example. Because we are world leaders in New Zealand in so many fields. And I thought, well, let's, let's embrace the story let's tell it little did i know that it would take me 13 years to make that i would have you know one bankruptcy in the process that possibly a nervous breakdown as well i don't have any hair left um <laughs> join the party you know yeah you know, <laughs> yeah anything all this greatest stuff so it's just been a mission it's been one it's been the toughest thing i've ever done in my life right but equally it's most rewarding and um yeah so it was just become obsession and i really felt it was a story that needed to be told and right. and um you know, I, I heard on Radio New Zealand one time someone said that um, um, stories are tales the dead want told. And there were 20,000 people that died up there. And I don't know, so maybe something latched onto me to, to push me to tell the story. But um, yeah, I, did, I gave it my best shot to tell it the best right. way I could. And I really went for the more of an emotional story. So I went for, um, instead of being an intellectual story, it was I, I tried to make it an emotional journey as right. opposed to an intellectual. So I'm trying to connect with the audience. That was the goal. Yeah. And the film seems to kind of take place and or have two parts to it. You have, mm. you have the kind of build up the background, a mm. lot of archival footage, yeah. uh, detailing how it came to this point where there's this civil war in this previously mm. peaceful country, yeah. and then the story of how New Zealand kind of stepped in without using any guns mm. to solve the problems. Uh, mm. Was that 
as a filmmaker, is that how you approached it at the beginning, or did it kind of evolve into that kind of yeah. dynamic? I think I think I really just went for the lineal story. Right. Uh, really followed the lineal story of, um, you know, which which sort of starts out as here's a here's a here's an uh, an island that suddenly lost its nationhood. It's tried three times to be independent. No time has ever been recognised by European powers. Um, following right up into what led to a war, and it's the same story everywhere in Africa, and it's just like a universal story. A, they've got a lot of wealth, that's a curse. Yeah. Um, exploitation comes in, and then next thing, it's civil war. Um, and so it's very lineal, um, and I really just wanted to try and give people the backstory of how this, how did this come to be, the biggest mine on the planet? How did it come to a war? And then how did it get resolved? So it's, it's and you've got Lucy Lawless narrating. Which yes, yes. So she's and she's really powerful too as a narrator. And just I mean, she's really. I, when I spoke to her, actually, she, she, I said, "What was it like? I heard you got arrested like last week. She jumped on an oil rig." Right, right. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and she, she said, "Oh, it was really scary." Hey, eh? she said, "It didn't matter. You know, you could be." the king of the world you're locked behind bars you're nobody right and she said it was really frightening you know right. really she was just suddenly a nobody just in a little cell um and she's a re you know she really genuinely is engaged in all aspects of changing the world for a bit into making it a better place and she, she was right into the story and she has a million things on and she gave us the time and i think she did a really good job with that you know and you've got some really kind of striking, frightening footage of the actual combat going on, the guerrilla combat in the jungle there. Where did all that stuff come from? Uh, that was a combination of 13 years of digging, right. hunting, begging, praying, and just being on the ground, right place, right time. So if you just keep trying, you'll get there. But the footage, as you say, it is striking. I mean, they were really stuck in the deep civil war. And unlike, you know, it, a, a typical civil war where there's sides, it's jungle, so there's not a there's no boundary. Right. And uh, and then it, it went from just like a Papua New Guinea against the island to the island and turning on itself. So it became a three way war. And like a lot of wars, they become very complicated. And you, there's no boundary. Like we we you know we we sort of think of war in a very much a you know, there's the bad guys, there's the good guys, they live this side, we live that side. Yeah. Civil wars, like, there could be 20 factions, who do we start, who's going to fire on us first, or who are we fighting? There's no clear boundary, and this was where New Zealand did well, and they rounded up all the factions and said, you're this, you're that, you're this, and that's that's been and gone. Now we move forward in a new direction. That was probably the most powerful thing they did, is just getting all the factions together, which is very difficult to do, you know. The other interesting thing about it is the role that women played in this whole thing because usually war is a men's game and men come along then and end it somehow or other but yeah. that's not the case here is it yeah well bougainville is a matrilineal society so women own all the land a woman get the land gets passed down from woman eldest eldest daughter mother to eldest daughter right so they are the key, and they, they don't even own the land, they're the keepers of the land, and they keep it for the next generation. So they don't, they don't even think about land as we do. We think about, well, I own it now, and then I'll sell it next week, and you know, my family will move to, to, to Whangarei or Whangarei or yeah. Tauranga or wherever they'll go you know, yeah. next year. And they, they, the only thing they own is land. Mm -hmm. And everything that they do is, the culture's completely around their land. So to have their land stripped from them, and also the power of the woman owning the land was stripped as well as the miners came in and stuff like this. So they had no say, which broke the, them completely away from their culture. So um, when New Zealand went in, they said, look, the, you know, what is this war over? And the first thing they said, well, it's over land. You know, they've mm -hmm. destroyed our land, they've poisoned our land, uh, poisoned our lakes, our rivers. And New Zealand said, okay, so uh, the war's over land, women own the land, so, to resolve this, we'll probably need women. Of the last 14 peace agreements, how many women have been involved? And so they had a quick tally up of all the women that have been involved, and they got to the grand total of zero. Right. Yeah. So New Zealand says, why don't we get all the women that own all the land yeah. in this country to New Zealand and get them to talk with the men to resolve this issue? Because certainly the last 14 peace attempts haven't gone very well. Right. So they got all the women over, and the woman said, "Well, this is the culture. This is how we need to do it." And then they got very much involved. And it was, you know, when you're in a civil war, or any war, men are like 
a lot of resentment, mass resentment. It's very hard to get them to start any negotiation or talk. So yeah, it was the woman that brokered the initial right. conversations and then pushed the, the piece, you know, continue right. and, and, and be pushed through. So they were really a big feature. And that was never part of my story. Right. I went in with my narrow right. Anglo eyes about this is a lineal story. It's going to go this way. And, of course, the river turned. Yeah. And um, oh, I just followed it, you know. So I just followed whichever path it took me yeah. as, as opposed to, going in there well you go in with the narrow view this is I think my story but of course as a documentary whatever comes in could be anything yeah. you know yeah 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 and the title itself uh, soldiers without guns is actually literal because that's what New Zealand ended up doing yeah. coming in and solving this problem without using any guns and actually not even having them with them mm. so we have a film clip instead of instead of guns they came in with guitars and yeah cultural events so explain what kind of what we're looking at here with this with this clip sure okay so um this is where they're landing um and so they landed in in lola hole um and then they went um they, they landed in several places actually but this particular clip is around lola hole and what they're doing is effectively um reaching out to the people and saying that we're here to create peace we are a cultural nation we do things the way New Zealanders do things, you do things the way you do them, and we're coming in here with the Melanesian way. It's your way, it's our way, we're gonna share each other's cultures, and we're going to really embrace how you do things, and we're gonna work with you. And uh, we're not just stuffy old white people that raise a flag and tell everyone what to do. Right. We are with you, we are part of you, we wanna share with you, we wanna grow with you, and we wanna learn what you do and how you do it. So it was a completely flip from what had happened where some old white guys showed up, raised a flag, this is now our country. Right. <laughs> you are now gonna do what you're told, um, and this is how it is. Yeah. Whereas New Zealand says, right, we're a multicultural country, we accept that you do things your way, we do things our way, and let's share what we've got. So it's just, it's all about sharing and understanding and compassion too, because they immediately went there, you know, to suddenly, if you imagine you've been in the middle of a sort of war, and all you've seen is guns, and then some people show up singing. <laughs> but that's, it's interesting because we're recording this uh, just about a week after the Christchurch shootings. That's right. And yeah. the entire world is looking at New Zealand and the way that the government is reacting, and particularly Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, yeah. and going, this is different. Um, you know, usually people would be talking revenge and we're going to you know, shoot everyone and we need, you know and that's not happening here and sure. they're looking at this going New Zealand's different and this film kind of shows possibly the roots of that or the fact that that's been part of us here all along because this happened on you know 20 some years ago so yeah. uh, it seems particularly relevant now very relevant today. I think that it's actually, the film has never been more relevant than actually right now. Um, and, you know, in New Zealand, we're not used to anything like this at all. And that's quite a common, it's, it's a common occurrence in other countries. So it suddenly landed on our shores and we're shocked. I'm certainly shocked from the whole thing. Um, and this story sort of will surprise many that haven't seen a country that reacts the way we are, which is we unite Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we immediately like sense that there's been you know an injustice done and we unite around those people where there's, where there's been an injustice and um, that's what I like about New Zealand but I think also like if you look at um, the culture of New Zealand we signed a treaty with the indigenous people 150 years ago and in that treaty we had to honour a number of different aspects of it which we have which we initially didn't do mm -hmm. but we're ongoing in reconciliation and we've had 150 years of reconciliation in New Zealand so we've learned to embrace another culture so we've got a multicultural country and it's Kiwi culture and we've we've learned to embrace something other than white Anglo culture yep. we've got a multicultural society and we understand that Muslims do things differently Buddhists do things differently everyone's got their own way of doing things and we embrace them and accept them and that's unusual for yeah. around the world yeah. and I think what they're say, seeing is an unusual country where we embrace all cultures we're excited to see new cultures look at them 
and free we're happy for them to express them yeah. and uh, yeah I, I think it really goes down to the fact that we made peace with the indigenous people that own the land here and we have made peace with them and we're now able to go over to other different countries and make peace with yeah. to help those countries make peace if you haven't made peace with your own country if all you've done is a really forced sorry how can you then expect to go over to a foreign country and make peace in a foreign country when your own land is in turmoil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're running out of time, but mm -hmm. uh, just you're you're previewing or premiering the film at the Civic. So yep. tell folks a little bit about what's happening there. Well, it's going to be a huge night, and it's been taking up a hell of a lot of my time. <laughs> what night is it? Um, it's the uh, Friday, the fifth of April. All right. So we have um, Tiki Tani playing live. Um, we have the Army Cultural Group, Army Navy uh, Defence Force Cultural Group. We have some Bougainvillian um, dance troupe singers coming along. We've got the actual movie, um, and it's all happening at the Civic. Well, the Civic is like one of 12 atmospheric cinemas in the world, two in the Southern Hemisphere. The sound is the most amazing thing you'll ever experience. It is, you know, the most beautiful cinema in the country by a long way. It's also the largest, but it's just the yeah. sheer scale and the beauty of it, and I just, that is the ultimate cinema. In New Zealand and it's just a really cool place to be actually launching this film you know well well good luck with the launch thank you and I do urge people to come and see this film especially now with everything else that's been going on it kind of makes everything kind of make a little bit more sense about what we're doing here in New Zealand so yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah thanks a lot thanks for inviting me along mm -hmm. cheers